Hey folks, do you like work? Do you like it so much you want to work every day until you die? Well, now you can. With today's prices, and especially with future prices, you'll be at work every day until you drop dead. But if you're one of those weird people who don't want to work forever and die for your boss, let's see if there's something we can do about that. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. This video is sponsored by Pat Robertson. He cut this channel a big check just before he died. George Carlin even made a speech to mark the occasion. I think he's down there now, screaming up at us. And I think he's in severe pain. Next, we're working on getting sponsorship from Henry Kissinger, before he joins Pat. Anyway, enough Dante. We were talking about your life. If the idea that you will never retire sounds dystopian, good. You're paying attention. You might have reached the same conclusions. But it's not supposed to be a prophecy of doom. I don't actually mean for sure you will never retire, because I don't know you and I don't know the future. Everything I could say about the future is just speculation, based on what I've observed in history and the present. All I mean is, if you're not rich and you're under, say, 50, and if things don't change course big time, I doubt you will ever retire. I'm sorry if you don't like to hear bad news. I just don't believe in the middle class dream anymore. I feel especially bad for young people who are being sold the same stuff as the past three generations. Say it with me now. Go to school, get a job, build a career, save money, invest money, retire at 65. We still live in the age of the baby boomers and their beliefs. Things have changed, but they haven't noticed, so they assume the same things are true today. They want to pretend things are fine that they're leaving us with a clean planet and the same freedoms and opportunities they had, so they don't feel bad about having done nothing while everything got worse. But I don't like to pretend things are fine. I like to face the facts, however disturbing they are. To quote Simone Weil, we must prefer real hell to an imaginary paradise. On this channel, I try to point out facts you might already have noticed but maybe hadn't put together, or to reveal how bad things really are and show you points of view you might consider, with the goal of helping you to sort of figure things out for yourself. But the purpose of this channel is also to motivate, because there's nothing inevitable about anything I say here. Everything depends on what we do today. So today, I want to talk about our options. This video is for people like me, who don't plan for retirement because we have no hope of ever making enough money to retire. Some of us will aim to just grab enough money, but the amount we need will go up every year. What if most jobs don't give us raises every year, and we can't keep up? What if it's impossible to save money? What if we save money, but there's an emergency? What if we save money, but then lose our source of income and can't get it back? Your present has been stolen, but the future is hypothetical. Things could go in many directions, but we can all make inferences based on the way things are. There are already old people who can't retire, and all signs point to the conditions underlying that fact getting worse. You need some passive income stream or lots of money saved to retire, which are not possible for most people. And since we're talking about the future, you can be sure if things don't change, you'll need much more money to live than you do today. I can't imagine what kind of inflation we'll be dealing with in 20 years or more. <laughs> There's a distinct possibility things will be so far gone the currency will be worthless. So if you can't retire, what can you do? You have options. You can die. 
You might even die before retirement age. Life expectancy has been dropping in the past few years, obviously partly due to COVID killing and weakening millions of people, but other things seem to have been getting worse too. Mass shootings, police power, land grabs, death due to climate change, whether from the heat, the cold, the smog, or the wars for water. If you've run out of money, you can live in the street and die from the record temperatures, or, or of an overdose, from malnutrition, at the hands of police, or maybe just stabbed by some poor guy who didn't even know his own name. But if all that seems sad to you, don't worry. You can also ask doctors to kill you. Have you heard of MAID, medical assistance in dying? You don't have to die of poverty in the street anymore. You can die of poverty in a clinic. People don't have enough to get by and they don't get enough from the state, maybe because they're not eligible, or maybe because the amount they get was set decades ago and hasn't kept up with inflation. So the state won't pay to keep you alive, but it will kill you so you're no longer a burden or a useless mouth as you were once briefly known in Germany. Even if you have money, you can die of environmental factors. You might die like the people in East Palestine, Ohio, who got poisoned when a train derailed in their town in February of this year, and who could have been saved if the rail company hadn't reduced safety standards and the state hadn't forced the unions to accept conditions that made the derailment possible in 2022, and if the government's power to protect the environment actually protected the environment. The increase in forest fires due to climate change, record carbon emissions, carbon dioxide levels in the air are now the highest they've been in more than four million years because of the burning of oil, coal, and gas. Plus, the daily environmental disasters we've become accustomed to will continue to poison you for the rest of your life, however long that is. You might die because you can't get a legal abortion, or because you got a virus on an airplane where no one was masking. It doesn't have to be COVID. There will be more viruses and more global pandemics. There are many options for your demise. The point is, all these specific causes of death are preventable. In a world where boys are taught to respect everyone's lives and bodies and differences and boundaries, we're not going to have many mass shootings. A world where the focus is on degrowth, shrinking the economy, shrinking consumption, and adopting renewable energy is a world with less pollution, less garbage, and less tearing up nature in the war for electricity and living space. A world where we take care of each other does not demand you die alone. But how could we create this world? Well we got to be strategic about it. You're not going to do it by planting trees, for instance, because those trees are still going to be owned by a big corporation that will cut them down, and then another corporation will pave over the space and turn it into luxury condominiums. You can give money to poor people, and even try to get wealthy people to do it too. But there will always be poverty and artificial scarcity under capitalism. You can teach your kids, great, but what about everybody else? The only way to create the new world is to fight the system that's holding it back. So what are you going to do? You could take your cause to the politicians to do something about it. That's what everyone says you're supposed to do, right? Or it's the only legitimate way to try to change anything. Or it's the only effective way to change anything. I'll admit there are some things that are worthwhile that could theoretically be achieved to an extent through the political system. It's just the system tends to require huge amounts of pressure for anything more than, you know, a 1% reduction in the sales tax. But something like UBI, Universal Basic Income, 
or land back for indigenous people or housing for homeless people, maybe at the municipal level, they might be attainable goals. But again, it requires pressure. And I don't mean they need to hear your voices to know what you want. They don't need to hear you. They already know what you want. More money for you, more for the poor, more for health care, reforms, environmental regulations, etc., etc. They've heard it all before. As I say a lot, if you demand, there needs to be a threat behind it. If not, they don't have to care about you. And the thing is, you need to mount a whole campaign just to try to change one thing while everything else continues to get worse. And you might not actually even make a dent in the problem. Sometimes these things end in a PR boost for a politician who kills this one unpopular bill that everybody heard about it, then gains a mandate to pass a million more terrible ones. In my experience, there are two types of people who tell you to work through the system. In other words, that nothing you do is legitimate unless you do it legally. There are the people who have little to no understanding of how the system works, who don't know any history, so they don't know we've been trying to work through the system ever since there's been a system to work through. That's the naive person. But there are also people who benefit from the status quo and who understand the system exists to prevent unauthorized change. They tell you to work through the system because they know it doesn't work. They'll try to trip you up with legality, civility, peaceful protest, and proper procedures, which, due to inflation, are luxuries we just can't afford. Putting pressure on politicians or someone else in government is a very indirect way of getting what you want, so it's really unlikely to work how you want it to. They might just ignore you or have you arrested, which is what they usually do. People with power don't have to do what you want, however much they use the word democracy. The state controls the legal use of force, so it has the last word. What we've been seeing is it will get more oppressive every day as all the other problems get worse and come to a head and we ask for more. People have been trying legal and nonviolent methods to stop the bulldozing of Weelani Forest in Atlanta to build a huge training center for police from all over the country, and since police cooperation is international, all over the world. This past week, despite huge crowds chanting no to Cop City all day and night, Atlanta Council voted to fund it, because who cares what the people want? In fact, they can use that kind of incident to show they're a tolerant democracy that listens to its citizens or whatever, instead of an authoritarian system painted democratic. As of this recording, at least 42 nonviolent protesters have been charged with terrorism. And the, the people who arranged their bail have been arrested and the funds stolen by police. And one activist, Tortuguita was shot and killed. Cops then planted a gun on the victim, who, they claimed, attacked them first. But more people are joining the fight to stop Cop City because they see how important it is. If they understand working through the system has not worked, they'll join the people using direct action to save the forest and, however temporarily, slow the expansion of state power. Because that's another thing we could do. Direct action. Direct action means doing the political action that needs to be done, but doing it yourself, instead of pet petitioning an unresponsive state. It's often a corporation causing the harm. You can put pressure on them by, say, writing to them and asking Nestle to stop using child slaves and Nutella to stop destroying the rainforest and Chiquita to stop putting stickers on everything. But again, you would need a whole campaign. Boycotts can be effective, but they need to be widespread. But you could also disrupt their operations while they're happening. 
you could go on strike. A general strike could probably paralyze an economy, which is a great place to make demands from. But that requires a lot of coordination. What can you do in the meantime? Have you seen any of the videos of people harassing oil company executives for their huge role in climate change? The corporation will not willingly put a stop to its standard procedure. The state won't try to stop the massive burning of fossil fuels, nor can we expect it to transition us to a post-carbon, post-growth economy. So these people have taken it into their own hands. Have you seen videos of indigenous people around the world getting beaten by the state for trying to protect their resources from being consumed and burned and flattened? They know the bulldozers have government support, so they know they can't stop them by asking the state. The things we should be doing most urgently to make the world better are illegal. What else could you do? You could teach others, like I try to do here. The only problem is most others, at least for now, are not ready to question their situation and might never be, no matter how bad things get. One of the biggest problems the heroes have in a dystopia is finding others to help them resist. Along with my other predictions, I think people will retreat more and more into fantasy worlds where things don't seem as bad. Reality is complicated, and most people aren't capable of grasping complicated issues that they've never studied. They won't know the fact from the noise. Many of them will tell you, you're wrong, because you don't describe to the truths they read from anonymous internet posters, or just because you no longer believe everything you were taught as a child. They might latch onto simplistic maxims to live by, like eat, pray, love, or work, save, invest. They'll put their faith in technology or an enlightened dictator to save the world. Others will suffer alone, not realizing everyone else is suffering from the same problems. They'll fall for all kinds of scams that promise to deliver them from their hell. Some of them will prepare for disasters on their own. Yeah, great. I mean, I get building a bunker so you can protect your family, not just from disaster, but from other people. But we could also protect other people by pooling our abilities and efforts and preparing as communities. Some people will learn from their situation or by you helping them put the pieces together or just from your example that things could be better. They're the people you can work with. Obviously, education alone is not enough. It's time to act, not to sit back and wait to die. And I feel the need to say that because that's what most people will do. We can't be in a dystopia. Everyone's just living normal lives. My guy, that's what a dystopia is. You're all living the same lives. Anyways, most people in a dystopia don't recognize it. That's why it's always one or a few characters against the whole world. Like, that's the entire thing about dystopias. Everyone living in them is so convinced that it's always been this way, will always be this way, is best this way, cannot change from this way, etc. Most people can't perceive the dystopia. Wouldn't we all know it? No! I should point out what others often mention, that dystopia is when the stuff white people have done to other people around the world happens to white people. Indigenous people never have to imagine a post-apocalyptic scenario. Destruction of land and water, eradication of population, plagues of illnesses, constant survival mode and traumatization, efforts to reclaim all we've lost. That's been indigenous existence since colonialism. Now that's not to blame anyone. I mean, should I blame myself for colonialism? but to make the further point that there are people who are already going through it and know they're going through it. So seek them out. If you want to change things, use solidarity as a starting point, 
which means solidarity with the most oppressed people, whoever they are. There are probably already radical organizations near you led by natives for decolonization or black feminists or homeless people or prisoners or radical unions or anarchists. So look for them in your area. See what they're doing and how you can help out. Whichever people you, you want to work with, organize mutual aid. The only way I can see any of us retiring is with mutual aid. Do you know what mutual aid is? Are you sure? Because it doesn't mean sending each other money over the internet. That's just what people call it to get your attention. Mutual aid is securing our needs for each other. If I have food, we have food. If you need a home, let's find you a home, or failing that, build you one. If a group is on strike, Mutual aid means providing them food or money or just people to stand at the barricades. If there's a natural disaster, mutual aid organizer, organizers, like your neighbors, show up to provide support. If you need protection, we'll protect you. Because mutual aid includes defense. Like direct action, mutual aid is a way of getting what you want and need without asking powerful people for it. There's more on both direct action and mutual aid in the description. As I say, the future hasn't actually been written yet. Things will get worse. But if enough of us work together, we might just survive and grow old.